D&D Beyond now fits in the palm of your hand with the free D&D Beyond app. It's the perfect tool set for beginners, regular players, and seasoned dungeon masters. Play faster with the guided character creator and access your character sheets, spells, and abilities wherever you go. All of your adventures and source books are at your fingertips, even when you're offline. Easily find and access the rules you need when you need them. With more features to come, download the free D&D Beyond app today. Welcome back to D&D Beyond for a very special D&D Beyond Live. We are almost there. We have nearly reached release day for The Wild Beyond the Witchlight, the next big adventure book from Dungeons and & Dragons, and the one that will finally take us into the Feywild for a full-length adventure. It comes out on September 21st and is available for, available for pre-order right here on D&D Beyond uh, or wherever you get your things. And here to talk with us all about it is one of the principal game architects for D&D and the project lead for this adventure. Please welcome back Chris Perkins. Hi. Aloha. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? Not too bad overall, not too bad. Uh... As I was saying before we logged on, I'm fighting a bit of an ear infection, so I'm mostly hearing out of my left ear. Uh, but uh, this is fun. I'm I'm looking forward to talking about all things fey and and witchy and Halloweeny. I, I love that it's out just in time for us to be in the middle of our campaigns at the perfect seasonal moment. Very nice planning uh, on your part, mm -hmm. and also. Thank you for being with us despite uh, that situation. And I give you permission to pretend any question you don't like came in the wrong ear. <laughs> Sounds good. Speaking of which, uh, before we get started, I am happy to say that we will have some time at the end of our stream to take a few of your questions, you in the chat, about the wild beyond the witch light. So get those ready and share them in chat and our wonderful moderators are gonna pass them along to me for the end of this hour. Uh, so, you know, please feel free to go wild with power, uh, and we'll see what happens. But let's get into it. Chris, what is the wild beyond the witch light? It is our first, uh, full blown Fey wild adventure. Um, not just for fifth edition, but really for any edition. Um, it's a, it's a wondrous realm, uh, that we're exploring this time around. It's not only full of Fey creatures, but full of weird magic and uh and oddball settings and i think uh, opportunities to role play unlike the kind of opportunities that you may have seen before in some of our other adventures i noticed one thing that i find very striking about this and it's been consistent the the last couple of adventures for me have felt like they are moving in this direction strongly but in this one especially setting theme, story, and character are all very closely intermeshed. Uh, was that uh, an intention behind it, something you arrived at, or just derived from the nature of the Feywild? Oh, no, it was certainly intentional. Um, some, of our, some of our adventures sort of begin as kind of a, a theme we want to tackle, and sometimes it's actually a location that we want to go to um, and explore, and sometimes it's uh, like a character hook, or it's a sort of a villain who's sort of at the center of it. But in this case, we kind of had all of that um, brewing in my mind, what, 11 years ago was when this sort of adventure was first started to crystallize in my mind. And I was thinking about all the things that I could throw into it, because uh, we don't get to go to the Feywild very often. And when I do finally go, I want to make sure I kind of throw everything I can into it just in case I can't get back to it anytime soon. So I remember I remember a long time ago, I wanted to tell a story in the Feywild and I had this sort of vision in my mind of a cauldron uh, that had, that was sort of sinister and, um, you know, like a typical black witch's cauldron, but it had like eight cats sculpted into it and eight toads and eight snakes and, you know, uh, and that image stuck with me almost a decade before I was finally able to sort of realize it and, and make it a thing. 
That's incredible. Because it, it sounds very much like being visited by a vision from the Feywild that was just sort of waiting for it you. It was. To- it was like I got a. It was like I got a Fey visitation, and it sort of incepted this this kernel of an idea in my head that stuck around for a long, long time. A lot of people don't know this, but we were actually slated to do the Feywild story in 2019, really? um, but it got delayed uh, when when Larian said they were going to do Baldur's Gate, and we thought, oh, well, we'll do something Baldur's Gate related in 2019. That actually turned out to be a bit of a blessing because I think. Um, the the timing of this Feywild story is is good. It it sort of lands at a time where I feel like I want a little optimism and lightheartedness um, in my life. There's a lot going on in the world, and D and D is great escapism. And this story in particular is all about escapism. <laughs> <laughs> the, the blessings and limitations thereof. Uh, yeah, it would have been a little bit heavy if like Avernus was dropping on us right now. <laughs> be like, yeah, yeah. Gnarliness. Uh, Avernus certainly felt like it belonged in 2019. Now I feel like we've moved on. <laughs> Although the great thing about adventures is that they will always be new to anybody running them for the first time. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So and every, uh, every, group's, of- every group's got its own preferences too, right? I mean... Some people's jam is going to hell and rocketing around on infernal war machines and that kind of thing. And other people like to, you know, talk to birds and 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 make deals with little fey creatures. And I will say, yeah, punching some infernals in the face uh, is also a totally valid form of escapism. So <laughs> we're not really uh, yeah. pick your poison. But uh, so we talked a little about why the time might have been right now for this one. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the Feywild itself and which sort of, of the, there are many visions of the realm of fairy. We were talking about potential inspirations on this stream a few, a few weeks ago because there's such a beautiful cornucopia of influences to draw on. How did you decide which ones were right for this Feywild and sort of gather them together? That is a really good question. So um, once I decided that we were going to show off uh, the first ever Domain of Delight, uh, sort of a, a specific domain within the Feywild, and that this domain hadn't existed previously in any source book. I wanted to make sure that there was enough going on there that it gave you sort of a, a real sense that the Feywild isn't just one kind of terrain or one kind of environment. It has it has as many or as diverse environments as you can find anywhere. So um, in the construction of this domain, I made sure, okay, yeah, we're going to have this sort of primeval forest corner of the domain. And that's a lot of people associate the Feywild with forests, but then we're also going to do a Fey swamp. And we're also going to do this sort of really kind of treacherous, stormy, mountainous realm. And all three of these things will be blended together to sort of give people a sense of just how varied a Feywild environment can be. Um, so that was that was sort of important. I think the other thing that kind of defines the Feywild is it it is a mirror of our world in a lot of ways. So there are things about it that are familiar, but at the same time, it's almost like a funhouse mirror. It's a little bit distorted. It's not quite the same. And so uh, one of the challenges we had was how do we portray the Feywild so that it's relatable? There are things that sort of you can relate to coming from you know the material plane or the, the natural world, but then how do we make it feel wondrous? How do we define things that are unique to the Feywild? So for instance, we sort of really leaned into this idea of the, the, the Feywild is a place of unfettered emotion where any creature, no matter how small, can exert some amount of influence over its environment. So if you're sad, and you're sitting on a rock. Well, maybe the rock itself sort of re-sculpts itself into a sad, sad visage. Or if you're happy and frolicking in a field, maybe the, the flowers all sort of turn their heads up at you um, uh, lovingly, you know, and, and hearts start to form in the clouds above your head. That, that's the kind of thing. And if you're an arch fay, then your ability to harness that is actually um, much greater. You can actually sculpt entire lands uh, based on the emotions that you're feeling. And so that was sort of an idea we want to get across. And that fey creatures have their own rules or their own sort of um, their behaviors or knacks. Like, for instance, 
the concept of the rule of reciprocity, where if you give a gift to a fey creature, they are obliged to give you a gift in return that they, busy, they believe is of equal or greater value. Well, that's a great thing to play with in the fey world because once the characters know that that rule exists, the role-playing opportunities that can emerge are you know, limitless. And I love the way that you you've you've taken a lot of ideas that sort of exist, uh, and and there there's a term that I like picked up in a poetry class at some point. Uh, it sounds bad, but it's not a bad thing. Uh, the the term pathetic fallacy um, comes from poetry and refers to sort of like you know clouds can't be angry. You perceive them as angry because you're angry. But this is sort of this beautiful what if of like okay, but what if they could though? What if that yes. actually? happens and it has consequences in the world of the game and it gamifies that literary and thematic idea in a beautiful way, which I think also applies to the rule of reciprocity. We're used to it in stories of like, yes, people make bargains and they go well or badly, but what about when that power of choice is in your hands? What can you do that will actually have real story consequences? Uh, and, yes, uh, yes. And the Feywild, to a certain extent, can enforce that. Like, there's almost like a there's a magical force behind these deals and these bargains that are sort of making you honor them. And so, um, one of the things that we're doing in tandem with the book is we're releasing a a PDF on DMs Guild, which is called Domains of Delight, and it's going to be a for charity thing. Um, and what it does is it sort of digs down into what the Feywild is and how it it can actually intervene. Like if you break a, a deal with a fae, the fae wild can impose a penalty upon you um, for that <laughs> infraction. And those kinds of things are sort of covered there because it's sort of beyond the scope of the adventure. There we're talking more about the fae wild in general, but in the adventure, you do meet a number of specific creatures who, whose behavior is shaped by their experiences of growing up in the fae wild. Uh, to harken back to your earlier question, though, another thing that was important in, insofar as defining the Feywild in this adventure was kind of striking a balance between the Disney-esque quality, you know, the, the Tinkerbells and the singing creatures and sort of the happy, colorful, lighthearted aspect with the more Grimm's fairy tales, bleak, uh, sinister, eerie aspect. It's like, okay... Yeah, you can sing with the birds, but there's also a cautionary tale here. And you could find yourself in serious peril. Um, there are creatures, even fey creatures, that are malign, um, whose, whose intentions are not pure, and you have to deal with that. And so this adventure strives to create a melange of those two aspects. So yes, there is the fairy tale palace atop the mountain peak, but there is a sinister side to it that you have to be careful of even while you're listening to the singing badgers or the, you know, the, the musician badgers and things like that. Like it, it was fun to be able to take uh, both the eerie and the cheery and kind of mix them all together. Uh, that's one of the things I think that's most appealing about this is that as so, as someone who's a big fan of both of those sides of the influences, uh, having them both together and having it be unpredictable, which piece this next one might be is just so much more fun than being straight one or the other, I think. Yes. One of my favorite places in the adventure you go to is a place called Downfall, which is this swamp village uh, populated by bullywugs. And the bullywugs are actually super charming. They sort of gather in a society they call the Soggy Court, and they dress in sort of royal finery, and they're very foppish and fun. But then at the center of Downfall is this old hag's cottage on stilts, and it's this lumbering, looming, very ominous and dreary structure. And I like the juxtaposition of the silliness of the soggy court and the fearsomeness of this hag's abode, sort of in the same place at the same time. I just, I have a soft spot for bullywugs, so I find that part especially exciting. And it's such a great play on the fact that they always sort of have issues of status within them. So of course the Feywild ones would have their version of that. Uh, and also the art is just glorious, uh, not to tip <laughs> the hand on any there, but uh, uh, so speaking of maybe growing up in the Feywild, can you talk to us a little bit about the new player options that we get in the Wild Beyond the Witch Light? We have two new backgrounds and two new races coming into play. Um, how did you hit yes. on the races that you used? Uh, that is a, that's an excellent question. So 
we entertained very early on the possibility of you maybe playing like a sprite or a pixie. Um, but one of the issues we ran into is that tiny creatures as player characters are sort of problematic within the system because, you know, how do you buy armor for your pixie? Um, that kind of thing. Um, and to sort of, so to sideline those questions, we came up with a, a playable race called the fairy, which is deliberately, um, we chose the fairy as the name of the race to create kind of an open-ended uh, uh, quality to it. You can sort of define yourself however you wish within that space. Like what kind of fairy are you? If you want to call yourself a brownie, for instance, um, that's fine. Uh, you can be a brownie fairy. Uh, if, if you want to sort of play more of a leprechaun-like character, then fine, you can be a fairy as well and, and sort of um, add some specificity as you will. But uh, so the fairy was kind of a no brainer. We thought, yeah, if, if we're going to introduce the Fey Wild, fairies just seem like a fun option to play. And we know they'll be popular. Um, Wait, can you be a brownie with fairy with an artisan background? And your backstory is that you were one of the shoemakers, brownies that like snuck in and did things. And that was like what you were doing before course. you became an adventure. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Um, if you want to play more like a sort of a ethereal, wispy, sylph like, uh, fairy, that's also great too. There's so there's so much range of possibilities. Um, with now the other race, the heron guns were not in. We we did not actually set out to create them. They sort of were created by force. And what I mean by that is, uh, we had heron guns in the adventure as NPCs, and they were they were basically little bastards who were who act like brigands, and and beat you up and punch you in the head and take your stuff. But uh, Sean Wood, our concept artist, did some concept art for them. And as we were showing off the concept art, people in Wizards, like on other teams and things, got to see them and kept, bought, kept hounding me and saying, this is what I want to play. I want to play this guy. Can I play this guy? I'm like, well, no, they're just monsters that you encounter. And, but I kept getting inundated with these, uh, with these asks to play the bunny folk that eventually we did include them in an Unearthed Arcana article. Um, we had we had some of our internal folks uh, do the mechanics and then uh, sent it off and they were undeniably popular so uh and there's nothing wrong with that uh people love playing animal headed humanoids that's just the way it is i mean look at them i i totally get and not, it and, and, you and your also... and your gun your heron gun doesn't have to be a bully <laughs> like the ones you need <laughs> in the adventure Although that would be an interesting start for this particular adventure, just uh, uh, to play through this particular one as someone who begins as rude and uncooperative would be like a difficulty setting, essentially. Um, I don't yeah. recommend yeah. being rude and uncooperative unless your party's in on it with you, but uh, fun possibilities there. Um, what in no, this adventure, you. sorry. Oh, and you, you had also asked about the backgrounds? Yes. So very quickly, um, there are two backgrounds, the Fey Lost, which is the background you take if your character prior to being adventurer basically either got uh, lured or lost in the Feywild for much of their childhood or adolescence. And that's really just sort of filling in a trope of, of sort of fey themed fantasy of the young child who is who chases after the rabbit into the woods and then unknowingly passes through some sort of fey crossing and then disappears into the Feywild or, or the one who's visited in the night by their bedside who wants to escape their home. And so the fairy godmother says, come with me, little child, and off they go. Uh, but they eventually make their way back home after a fashion. And so the Fey lost is somebody who basically lives in two worlds, has, has lived in the, both the material plane and in the Feywild. And um, that's just fun to, that's just a fun concept to play with. The other background, the witch light hand is very specific to this to something in this adventure, which is there is a carnival in this adventure that serves as the gateway to the Feywild. And uh, another literary trope is, you know, the, the child who joins the circus. And we thought, well, why not? Why not open up the possibility of your character having basically spent much of their childhood and early adolescence or adolescence in, in this Fey themed carnival? And so you became a witch light hand. Um, uh, hand is sort of a play on words because time is a big thing in this adventure. And uh, Mr. Witch, who runs the carnival, uses a uses a pocket watch to basically do it. And so 
uh, we see clock imagery and uh, all over this adventure. I love that. And I do also love that I feel like the adventure very much wears some of these influences on its sleeve in a really delightful way, um, where you all have put the title of the classic Ray Bradbury novel on the back of the book, just to sort mm -hmm. of lead people into it. Uh, and, you know, references to some of those stories you were referring to earlier pop up uh, in really fun, rewarding places. Um, but that's not the only uh, things that you've sprinkled into the book. You've also got some wonderful surprises for experienced players, for longtime fans of D&D. &D. Um, I, okay, this just my question. Thacko the Clown. Did you settle on a sad clown for Thacko because a sad clown is the only person who's better when they're low? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to say yes, because that is a brilliant way of looking at that character. Um, it was, uh, I think it was actually Jason Rainville, the artist who gave uh, Thacko his final expression, but it was based on a piece of concept art that Sean Wood had done of the character, which actually had the character smiling. So his expression actually changed from concept art to final. And I love your explanation. But uh <laughs> You're, when you're when you're running second edition and using Thaco, low is always best. Um, it's uh, there, there was no direct inspiration for Thaco. Uh, all all Thaco was originally conceived to be was just a nod to the past, mm -hmm. and nods to the past are all, like you say all over this adventure. Um, I know. And we were, were looking. We, we knew we were going to have a. We were. We knew we had a clown, and we knew we needed a name for it. And uh, Thaco is just a perfect clown name. It is, which would never occur to any of us. But uh, the uh, you also, as you've talked elsewhere, folks should track down about uh, some of the wonderful Easter eggs that you'll encounter from uh, the history of D and D in the game. Um, at what point in the process, this eleven-year uh, gestation of this book, did you put together that you wanted to pull in some of those references for it? Uh, pretty much from the first time I started thinking about it to the to the couple of days before it was about to go off to the printer. So stuff just kept getting injected all at different points. Like I knew fairly early, like a few years ago that I wanted War Duke, uh, sort of a classic character from the cartoon series who you know we once rendered into an action figure back in the eighties. I knew I wanted to figure out a home for him in the story, but for instance, um, the, the nod to the D&D cartoon series uh, the little the little Easter egg on the poster map uh, tied to that that was that was added late and not by me that was done by the cartographers um, during the rendering of the map and then I looked at it and said yes exactly um, it was it was so perfect I don't want to spoil it I want people to look for it themselves but it's really cute and it's 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 another one of those things that sort of points you to some uh, prior era of the game, of the game's history. All right. And this is probably a good point to say that if you are planning to play through the Wild Beyond the Witch Light, uh, we are about to get into some, not spoilers necessarily, but some of the other stuff that I love about it or that's more DM oriented. Um, so just uh, the, that's where we're crossing the, the, the Fae crossing right now into that territory. Um, one of the things that you designed for this adventure is that, uh, in I, I think a first for a major adventure, uh, this uh, you you made this one an adventure that can, if you want to, and if you're interested in doing this, and if you're able to do this, you can play through the wild beyond the witch light without combat. Was that always in the plan? Did it evolve as you go? And why is it appealing as a designer to try to make something like that? It wasn't always in the plan, uh, but but you articulated it very well. That it, it's sort of an option. Um, you can you can hack and slash your way through this adventure just like any D and D adventure. If that's if that's how you roll, um, there's lots of things to kill, and there's lots of evil things uh, out there trying to do harm to to good folks. Um, but uh, at some point, it was kind of in the middle uh, of of the early sort of concepting for the project, but before writing had begun. It occurred to me, looking at all the elements that I was hoping to include, that this adventure, given its setting and given the nature of the threats, might actually lend itself well to um, DMs who want to run it for younger players. 
uh, I thought there's a, there's a lot here that could that could really appeal to younger players. And as I was thinking about that, I was also thinking, well, maybe this is maybe this is the right time to to really think about um, creating an adventure where players are sort of tested or encouraged to creatively think their way through the adventure in nonviolent ways. Uh, you know, if if you're running for for your kids or whatever, and you you just assume not have them murder their way through it, you can sort of prompt them to think about how they can solve their problems without having to resort to violence. And, and uh, I also thought it would just be a fun design challenge to make sure that there's always multiple ways to sort of get past each situation. Because I think that lends us self, that, that's actually just a good practice as far as adventure design goes. And even beyond this adventure, I'd like to try to continue that trend whenever possible to make sure that we're presenting scenarios where there isn't just one way through. Um, because I think that's one of the charms of D&D is the creative problem solving and rewarding characters for coming up with unorthodox or unusual ways of getting around things. Um, I think that's, that's something that we should be encouraging whenever possible. Uh, I will also say that one of my favorite old adventures is uh, a module that released back in the early 80s called Beyond the Crystal Cave. And uh, just so you know, uh, while Beyond the Witchlight didn't, wasn't the pioneer in these waters, that adventure actually allowed you to basically talk your way through it. Um, and so I, I may have been channeling some of that. I love that. And and also a lot of the, the we've been talking about monster, the monsters that you find uh, here on the channel. And we were talking about two returning monsters that speak to the fact that a variety of tones work in D&D, &D, but also that the seeds of all these variety of tones have been present throughout the history. So we were talking about the Jabberwock and about the Campestries, who are amazing, uh, who are a wonderful <laughs> testament to D&D &D containing <laughs> multitudes. Yeah, so the campestries, for those who don't know, are tiny singing mushrooms, and they're ambulatory, so they can sort of follow you around singing in their nasal falsetto. And they're, they're, they, they love to learn new songs, so every time you sing to them, they basically internalize it, and then we'll just keep singing that song over and over and over again until you teach them another song. Uh, so uh, they, can, they can be quite tedious <laughs> as well. But they're, um, they originally appeared in an old dungeon magazine issue issue 41 in an adventure called old man Catan the incredible edible dancing mushroom band and i've loved them since that first appearance and was just dying to bring them back uh, and this this gave me an opportunity to do so but it was actually claudio posas who's one of our artists did the new art for the campestry and it's my it could be my favorite piece of art in the entire book because it's just so ridiculously happy um, <laughs> It's, it's got a contagious smile I just absolutely love. Um, and so uh, they're, they're fabulous. Now, the Jabberwock um, traces its origin back to an old Gary Gygax adventure from, uh, from first slash second edition called Dungeonland, which was Gygax's attempt to do a D&D &D Alice in Wonderland. Um, actually, I think it appeared in the sequel, The Land Beyond the Magic Mirror, but whatever. I remember uh, I reincarnated it back in second edition for an adventure called The Manx and Foe, which appeared in an adventure anthology. And um, I didn't have any, I, don't, I think it was actually decided quite late that we were going to put it in the adventure. And it wasn't me who wanted to do it. I think it was Will Doyle, uh, my co-writer, um, who proposed bringing it back. And so we quickly, hastily created some concept art for it. Uh, and then uh, he slid it into his part of the adventure. Uh, and Will Doyle and Stacey Allen are the cartographers you referred to earlier, right? Will Doyle and Stacey Allen are not only the cartographers for this project, but they are also both co-writers on the project, which was hugely advantageous because it meant we could do the maps fairly early in the process, or at least sketches of the maps, and then work off of them. Um, and their 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 stuff in the adventure is their their text is utterly charming, and the the maps are just brilliant in their in their uh, vibrancy and uh, just adorableness. There's lots of little lots of little things you can look at on the maps. Even There's the so much richness. 
Yeah, there, there's yes. design in every element uh, of this book, from the story information to the NPC personalities to the handouts, um, which brings me to something I'd love to talk about. Some of the DM tools that you all have put in Wild Beyond the Witchlight are really, really fascinating to me. Uh, in something that I think this, I think this adventure will be extremely satisfying for longtime DMs, but I think it also will be among the friendliest I've ever seen for new DMs. Uh, and I, I love, it includes things like, uh, role-playing cards as uh, references for the NPCs, um, a story tracker that has been included to help sort of guide you in keeping track of information over time. Um, uh, most of us with our, like, notebooks where we're bookmarking random pages of what happened in week eight, uh, will probably, for me, maybe a little bit of a revelation there. Uh, and it includes, I, I, I mentioned this to you off stream but I think maybe my new favorite piece of D&D text is a little box called Making Mistakes that's included with the DM instructions uh, that essentially just says, don't panic. Uh, this is part of the process. <laughs> uh, but uh, how did you hit on that? Like, why was this the right adventure to put that stuff in? Uh, and and what was the, the thinking behind that? Wow, great question. The, Sorry, big question. So this adventure is... <laughs> Yeah, no, this is that's great. I, it's this adventure is part of a continuum. Um, you know, it follows a series of adventures that we've released for this edition previously, and every adventure I think should be a learning opportunity, and we should be able to take lessons from our from our previous uh, creative efforts and apply them. Um, this was a case where, due to the fact that we're going to a new realm and we're doing a lot of new things, and we're already breaking a bunch of new ground. Uh, it occurs to me that we can just do better uh, to help new DMs, particularly with these big adventures. Because if you're going to run a 200 and some number of pages adventure, you're kind of buying into something pretty big and significant. And it makes sense that some portion of that adventure should be set aside to sort of help you manage it a little bit better. Um, and so... This was just an op just just our latest opportunity to explore some new things, like the story tracker you mentioned. I don't know how many DMs are actually going to use it or want to use it because different DMs track information differently. But at least we can show you what a story tracker might look like and how you might be able to utilize it. Um, the information in the introduction that talks about, hey, DM, here are some tips to know, like when you show dice rolls to your players and stuff like that. That's actually the kind of information I wish was in the DMG. Um, mm. And if, if I ever get another chance to, to, uh, to tweak the DMG, I'll probably stick it in there. But it's, it's really sort of basic level stuff to, to relax the DM. Um, since this adventure is pretty approachable, I think it's, it's probably going to be played by a lot of new DMs just because of the subject matter. And so this seemed like a really good place to double down. I love that. And it, I do feel like I can see what you're talking about in terms of the continuum that uh, like in this last year, both Tasha's and Ben Richten's have included really helpful running the game advice that just sort of fit with uh, the things that they were doing. So it's like you're, you're assembling a pretty amazing body of all of the all of the lore that has been passed DM to DM, but not necessarily made it into the official yes. instructions over time. Uh, I love yeah. that. And we're always somewhat limited by space, um, but we try to we try to press. We're going to try in the future, I think, to press as much of that kind of useful information um, uh, uh, into adventures when appropriate. And of course, with all of uh, being what's right for you and your table and your style, always the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's like you know, several years ago, we decided uh, that sometimes it's helpful to pull the flow chart of the adventure in the adventure. So sometimes we do that. We have different tools now and uh, like the pronunciation guides is another one, which I love DMs them. found Thank you. helpful. So, you know, every, every adventure is a new learning opportunity, new opportunity to make the, the task of DMing easier on folks. <laughs> what pieces do you hope people might uh, pull off of this and use in their own games? Oh gosh. Um, so, the Wild Beyond the Witchlight is deceptively modular. Um, most of it, its chapters can be peeled off to sort of create discrete smaller domains if you want to. Like uh, we explore the domain of Prismere extensively, but your campaign, in your campaign, you might decide that I just want to use 
you know, downfall and the soggy court and the bullywugs and the hag in the and the hag in the hut, and that's about it. It's very easy to do with this project to break off a piece and just use that piece in your adventure and have the characters spend make a small trip to the Feywild, um, and then and then leave. The the biggest piece I think that a lot of people are probably going to break off and just use on its own is the Witchlight Carnival itself. Uh, because it's tailor-made for it. Uh, we wanted this adventure to start on any world. And so the carnival can touch down on your campaign setting world at any time, anywhere you want. And it's it's sort of a self-contained experience. You don't even have to go to the Feywild. And frankly, our playtesters, when they were running the adventure, a lot of them didn't want to go to the Feywild. They just wanted to hang out at the carnival. <laughs> And so it just makes, if you want a sort of a fun evening of play in a sort of strange landscape, the Witchlight Carnival by itself can be a lot of fun. Fantastic. Uh, let's see. Please do be sending those questions because we're going to get to those in just a couple of minutes. But before we do, uh, let's see. Can you tell me a little bit more about the uh, the fabulous NPCs of the Wild Beyond the Witch Light, which have been fleshed out wonderfully? I think a personal favorite is Mudlump, uh, who I cannot <laughs> wait for folks to encounter. Um, but uh, what was the thinking behind? Like they're they're particularly rich. Obviously, you've included cards for role playing them. The the style of play where all of these decisions and interactions have consequences comes into play with a lot of them. Uh, but how did you approach that in a way that's still game design that combines theatricality and game design? So when we get down to the NPCs, it's interesting because it was really a collaborative effort at that point um, where all of the all of the writers were basically um, coming up with characters and then trying to figure out a way to kind of weave them all together. Um, I think the instructions I gave at the outset were in your various pieces, make sure that you have characters who are natives uh, who can sort of tell you how the Feywild is supposed to be, who are intruders, like the characters who have just sort of invaded this realm and are, and are just as strangers, and then um, poor sods who have gotten tangled up with the Hourglass Coven uh, uh, and you're either beholden to them or have suffered some consequences as a result of breaking a pact with them so that we get, the, so that, we get that range. Um, uh, you mentioned Mudlump specifically. He's a um, Cyclops beekeeper. Um, that that was Stacy Allen's creation. Um, and uh, there's a potential later in the story for you to hook Mudlump up with another giant, um, and they can go off together and live a happy, happily ever after <laughs> scenario. Uh, the other giant was Will's creation. So Will and Stacy sort of conspired off to the side to make this potential love affair a reality in the adventure. Um, from my point of view, uh, in this story in particular, I think we have an overabundance, if not an abundance of just colorful, of a colorful cast of characters. And that's, that's really to sort of create this impression of the Feywild being this kaleidoscope of, of personalities and um just to kind of overwhelm you in a way with all of just the the, the whimsy and the, the the wildness of it all um not all the characters get the get a role-playing card treatment because they're just too many but the major npcs do basically we try to figure out which npcs are you likely to interact with for a protracted period of time and those are the ones that we did sort of deep dives on where we gave them personality traits and flaws and, and that kind of thing. And others that you meet, you just kind of meet them once and then wave goodbye. And they're really there to sort of show you a shade of the Feywild that's sort of new and a slightly different color from what you've seen up to that point. And that's fine too. And those were just Although you know players, design they courses. will pick random ones to adopt from that group. Well, yes, yes, they'll they'll befriend the random snake that they met, the talking snake that they met outside the tower, and that snake somehow will become a full fledged party member and possible cohort, and you know, um, and and live on in infamy in campaigns. I can't I can't predict which characters a particular party will glom onto. Um, I can just make my best guesses and go from there. 
Um, all right, let's see. Do you have anything that you would want to tease about, uh, like there are some very cool magic items uh, coming in this book? Yeah, so um, the, the magic item section of this book is a combination of things that you've seen before and things that are new. Uh, we picked up several of the common magic items from Xanathar's Guide to Everything and actually illustrated a few of them uh, for the first time. Um, mainly because common magic items are often just fun, flavorful uh, tchotchkes that are kind of power neutral. And we could just, you know, <laughs> spill them out and let characters accumulate them willy nilly. Those are always great. But we also introduced a number of new magic items. Um, the aforementioned cauldron that haunted my early dreams uh, plays a prominent role in the adventure. It's a very, very, very powerful magic item. Uh, others were included because they tie into elements that we had already decided to include. Like if you're going to have the Jabberwock, well, then you need to have a Vorpal sword in there, right? Um, and so we have Snickersnack, a particular Vorpal weapon uh, that you can use to, to kill the Jabberwock if, if other efforts to deal with the Jabberwock should fail. Um, and things like that. And then just other sort of whimsical stuff born out of necessity. Um, and one part of the venture, you kind of go into a magical garden and uh, uh, Will wanted a magic item called a chromatic rose. You can basically find a garden of chromatic roses and they, they have sort of magical properties. Uh, things like that. Things like um, we wanted some of the prizes that you get in the Witchlight Carnival to be magical. So one of the things we have are packets of pixie dust. And so we've defined the magical properties of pixie dust now. Stuff like that. So uh, the magic items really exist to serve the story. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I uh, I think, oh, I can I can actually sneak one of the audience questions in right now. We will be getting to those in just a couple months, minutes, but this is a perfect moment. Uh, Laura Armejo asks, is there a fairy dragon somewhere in this adventure? Why, yes. Yes, there is. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, his his name is Sir Talavar, and he is a he is a he's a charming knight. Um, and finally, I, I there's so much I want to get to the the in this, but I don't get all the time to myself. I do have to share. Um, but I would love to hear just a little bit about uh, that hourglass coven you mentioned. Ah, yes. So um, reinforcing the theme of time, which is throughout this adventure, it's literally everywhere, um, is this idea of a coven of hags who call themselves the Hourglass Coven because they too are somewhat preoccupied with time. Um, they are, as you expect of hags, uh, not to be trusted, <laughs> uh, but you can, you can actually negotiate with them. Uh, you, can get you can get as much out of the hags as, uh, as you want. You just have to be willing to wheel and deal with them. And that's always a double-edged sword. And so uh, I don't want to give too much away, but they are, these hags are unique. That is to say, they're not just green hags or anise hags or night hags or sea hags. Uh, each one is a unique creature and uh, with specific characteristics. And uh, one of the most this project was actually concepting these three these three delightful ladies um, and making sure that they are unforgettable. I am uh, a big fan of them and considering just, you know, an alignment switch uh, in, in their service, which is probably not a retractable choice. But uh, speaking of which, uh, we did notice that the monsters in this have, for instance, the Jabberwock has a typically uh, alignment on it. Um, would you, can you speak a little bit to the decision to, to bring that into play? Yeah. So um, a project two or go, we actually tinkered with the idea of stripping alignments out entirely. Uh, but then uh, uh, because, you know, we try to keep our one finger on the pulse of the community, we, 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 we shifted away from that to uh, go with the typically to reinforce the idea uh, where appropriate that uh, if you don't know what the if you don't know or you don't care what the creature's alignment is, you can just assume that it's it's typical alignment. 
Um, but by putting the typically there, we basically make it, we, 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 we double down on what the monster manual already says, which is in the monster manual introduction, it says that a creature's alignment doesn't have to be what is stated in the stat block, that it can be different. But a lot of people miss that information or they, uh, they, they, they didn't catch it during their read through mm -hmm. th that introductory material. So all we're doing in the stat block is reinforcing that idea that if you have a story in mind and that story includes taking this creature, but get, giving it a different disposition um, from what it, what it typically has, then you can change its alignment and freely do so and not feel bad about it in the least. <laughs> now, certain I, I creatures, are, element, if because... you're, if you're a humanoid no, creature, if you're a humanoid <laughs> creature, you don't typically have a typically alignment. You have, uh, instead, we're just saying, you know, any alignment. Hmm. Because humanoids, um, uh, be they elves, dwarves, or, you know, anything, uh, they have the full range. If they have the full moral and ethical range of, of, of we human beings, then they should be able to have any alignment. I, I, that makes total sense. Um, I would like to ask on behalf of chat, what is the name of our friend who has joined us on stream? Because I know they want to know. We're hearing some a, a special guest making an audio appearance in the stream. I'm just asking your dog's name. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't pick up on that. Oh. Uh, yeah, that's my dog, Milo. He is barking at presumably some other dog, possibly the <laughs> white and black one who is his arch nemesis. They've never actually been within 30 feet of each other, but for some reason they don't like each other. Oh, maybe they want. I think it must out. be, that's... I think, I think it's pheromonal actually. I think there's something about the smell of the other dog that sets him off. That's all I can raise him. Mm -hmm. So please He's normally drop really some nice. Milo's in chat in honor. Um. Speaking speaking of dropping <laughs> speaking of dropping Milo's, there's a there's a Milo Easter egg in the Wild Beyond the Witchlight. Oh, I don't think I found that oh. one yet. Oh, that's exciting. Okay, um, I will I will leave. Uh, I will not say any more. <laughs> uh, that's that's yes. you coming up. It's it's all about the guest Come appearing Come appearance. Come up. Come on. That's good boy. Come on. You need to lose weight or something, man. You're having trouble getting up there. Hang on. <laughs> and uh, I think this go. is a good moment there we as, go. we, as our guest joins us. Oh, oh, yes, Milo, is. hi. This is my there first is. chance to meet him, so I'm excited. He's very camera Aww. shy, so he probably won't look directly into the camera. But it's a beautiful profile. Yes, indeed. So we have some wonderful questions coming in from chat. Thank you all so much. I'm going to see how many we can get through in our remaining time. Redbeard in 84 starts us off on a great note. Uh, would Mr. Perkins care to confirm or deny that he is, in fact, an Archfey? Uh, I can neither confirm or deny. There are disputed reports about whether I'm an Archfey or a Lich or a vampire or possibly a robot. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, um, I do live in my own Fey domain, so I guess Archfey is probably apt. Let's go with that. Do I have any special Archfey powers? No, not really. Um, <laughs> or are you the Archfey who doesn't know that you're bending the environment around you? Yes, that could be it. Yellow does it uh, has a question that I think I can go ahead and answer, asking any new class or subclass options in the Wild Beyond the Witch Light. Um, so that that's a no from my knowledge. Um, but we nope. talked through some of the other stuff you get. Um, uh, Although see. if you are, if I'm you gonna... are playing, if you, if you are playing a warlock with an Archfey patron, you can choose the Archfey of Prismere as your patron. Um, and we haven't talked about the Archfey of Prismere, nor do I want to, because uh, the, uh, the Archfey of Prismere is something of a mystery and best discovered. Um, by yourself. Excellent. Yes, there is some tasty stuff uh, for Warlock specifically that is an option uh, in terms of approach to the game uh, that I thought was very cool as well. Um, Aunt Nugay asks, uh, what was the inspiration behind Herringons and asks if there's any Redwall influence? The Brian Jakes books beloved by many of us. 
That is a really good question. And for that, I'm going to have to punt uh, because uh, my co-writer, Ari Levich, who uh, is one of our in-house designers, was the one who decided to, uh, who wanted to create Heron Guns. And I know, if I recall correctly, he was actually inspired by some old uh, black and white line art illustrations of mean rabbit people doing mean things. Um, and I don't know where he got the inspiration exactly, but uh, he was just enchanted by, by the art and asked if we could have rabbit folk in the adventure. And I said, of course, yes. I do love that the, the rabbit folk putting themselves into the game uh, feels very much like the Feywild Inception we were talking about, where I'm just going to assume that this adventure helped create itself, uh, in addition to all the hard work <laughs> you all did. Hmm? Uh, Laura Mayer asks, how important is it for players to create characters specifically crafted for this adventure? Not important at all. Um... You, you can go into this adventure with just a, a character of your own concept and uh, the adventure hooks that get you in lend themselves well to that. Uh, one of the adventure hooks is pretty, is a tradition, what we, what we call a traditional hook, which is some outside motivator basically sets you on a quest um, and you don't have to have any embedded uh, information about the adventure in the construction of your character. Your character could be whatever you want it to be. Uh, the other hook is actually a character-driven hook where you sort of, the players buy into, one or more of the players buy into a basic assumption, and that is they visited the carnival as children, and it has since come back around. But the last time they, to, they were at the carnival, they lost something that was important to them. It was basically, uh, and they haven't been able to get it back since. And so the characters basically embark on a quest to get back that which they have lost. And it's actually causing some kind of, um, it's, it's more than just a sentimental thing. It's actually um, affecting you as a character uh, and will affect your sort of ability to grow as an adventurer if you don't get this sort of missing piece of yourself back. And so um, if you use that hook, then you kind of sit down with your DM or you roll on a table to decide what it was that you lost um, so that you now have something to, to go after. That's very delicious. Uh, since the last time the carnival was in town comes every eight years, right? Yes, it cycles, it cycles around uh, world to world every eight years. And uh, we chose the number eight for a few reasons that are articulated in the adventure. Debbie Flane asks, what race and class do you, Chris, think would be a lot of fun to play in a Feywild setting? I got to think a, a Warlock of the Archfey Pact would be super fun to play. Um, I think, uh, gosh, um, I would love personally just to play a wizard. In the Archfey as well, uh, in the in the in the land of the Fey as well, because I think that uh, being able to trade magic or uh, offer up magical goodies, uh, ma magical aid to Fey creatures, could actually um, be quite a quite a gift that they would respond well to. But I think the the best class to play in this adventure is the Bard, uh, because you know a, a winning personality will get you farther in the Feywild than a sword or a spell will. That's so intriguing. Uh, speaking as a highly <laughs> partisan toward the bard class myself. Uh, to Chris from Camerdar Pal, who he might also remember as Prolok, uh, how many beloved characters in this adventure will you traumatize your players with through Ceramorphosis? <laughs> Uh, I think you're safe from Ceramorphosis in this adventure. I don't think you, you will not find a single Mind Flayer poking its tentacle into the Feywild in this adventure. Uh, so uh, no, trauma will come in other ways though, um, rest assured. Dandy Elise asks a question that I think we may have the answer to. Can we hear about any of the Arch Fey featured in the new Feywild release? And I would say that is a wait and see, although they might want to check out that supplement you were talking about that's going to be going up, yeah? 
So yeah, we're we're keeping the Archfey of Prismere, who's central to the story of the Wild Beyond the Witchlight, under wraps so that DMs can surprise and delight their players. But the Domains of Delight product, the, the PDF that we're going to be releasing on DMs Guild uh, for Extra Life Charity, that has, in addition to a chapter on uh, the Feywild, the Seelie and the Unseelie Courts, Fey Pacts, Fey Curses, and uh, whatnot, uh, is a chapter on creating your own Archfey and creating a domain of delight around that Archfey. And then uh, it ends with a sample Archfey who is depicted in The Wild Beyond the Witchlight it is a giant spider that reads storybooks to awakened animals. Um, and that Archfey's name is Yarn Spinner. I am very excited because uh, that is one of my favorite pieces of art in the whole book. Uh, and I'm yeah. definitely going to need this. <laughs> that is Rasmid also one of my favorite pieces of art. Oh. Rosmeet asks, can you elaborate on how time works in the Feywild versus the material plane? Yes, it works however the DM wants it to, ultimately. <laughs> And that, sound, that sounds like a cop-out, but actually that's kind of what the DMG recommends as well. It's like, this is a tool that DMs can play with, um, but we don't enforce sort of time dilation and, and weird things because we don't know what effects that might have on your campaign. So mm -hmm. uh, there are time effects in the adventure though. Um, uh, for instance, you can go to a place where time has stopped in the adventure. Um, and what does that mean? And what does that do? To, what, what sort of environment is that? That's kind of interesting. How do the players interact with time stopped creatures? Uh, you know, things like that. Um, so we do, we do mess with time quite a bit uh, within, within the structure of the adventure itself. And uh, there, there are mechanisms in the adventure, particularly toward the end, where the DM can figure out, okay, when do the, when the characters go back to their world, what, how much time has passed? And there is a section of the adventure that deals with that specifically and uh, provides guidance to the DM uh, so that they can decide what the, what the time dilation is. Amazing. Uh, on a maybe slightly less serious note, we have a question from Aaron Lore. Uh, will you do your campestry voice for us? <laughs> Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, I guess it would probably sound like <laughs> But that, but a swarm of them and going forever. <laughs> yes, exactly. Amazing. Uh, and we have, sorry, a standard D&D Beyond question that we have to make sure that we get on the record. Do you have a favorite dinosaur? A favorite dinosaur? Um, yeah, I would say my favorite dinosaur is either the, oh, I'll, I'll just settle down one. It's got to be the T-Rex. T-Rex. Ah, the, it, is it the hand specifically? <laughs> yeah, it's the so you just like the mechanical mouth, balance the of it, hands. big jaws, small hands. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Uh let's see. Rubik wants to know how you would work the carnival into one of the ten towns. So it seems a bit odd, uh, but like how would you approach something like that? Oh just comes uh, to down? When, by, by ten towns you mean the ten towns of Icewind Dale, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm assuming. I'll assume that. So I would say, so, so when the Witchlight Carnival lands, it, there is actually a mechanism by which it sort of can reshape the land in which it lands in. So that like, for instance, if it wants to land, but there are trees, there's like a, a treant that works on staff who can actually cause the trees to move out of the way and things like that. Uh, so there's already sort of built in some geographical manipulation effect that the, that the Witchlight Carnival is capable of doing when it when it settles in a place so that it can have the configuration that it wants to have. So I would say in a place like cold winter north of Icewind Dale, that when the Witchlight Carnival touches down, the snow just sort of recedes and melts away 
and there's this, this like bubble of autumnal air that just sort of surrounds it. Um, and of course, they don't, since the Witch Light Carnival operates uh, mainly at night, certainly the darkened skies wouldn't trouble them all if the place is well lit and, and all that. So really, I think it just sort of brings its own bubble of autumn with it. I love that very much. Uh, thank you all for those very excellent questions. This has been so much fun. I, I think the final one, Dar 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 if we have just a second here, asks, Darger, I'm so sorry if I'm massacring your name, Darger. Uh, can you mention uh, some of the hints and Easter eggs that hinted at this adventure in previous books? Um, I will, oh gosh, can I say that without You want to just make people look no. for them? <laughs> yeah, I think at this point in time, let's let, dig around for them. There are ties. So this book was sort of um, forecast in an earlier book um, from not too long ago. I will say that. And there are elements in that book in this new adventure. This new adventure, Wild Beyond the Witchlight, also plants a couple seeds that we hope to pay off um, in the not too distant future but I don't wanna tell you what they are because I can't do it without spoiling what the future products are and I can't do it without <laughs> spoiling um, something big. So, but yeah, we're always well, doing that uh, with, our, with our products. We're always creating little, little links between them and uh, I hope you find them all. As a comic book fan, I'm, I'm a huge uh, lover of the like little continuity plant that guides you between those worlds <laughs> um I, this has been such a blast thank you so much for joining us to talk today all about the wild beyond the witch light i should note if you're watching this you can pre-order it on dndbeyond.com and if you do pre-order it you're going to get some amazing perks which is eight frames eight themes eight gorgeous backdrops and one set of ringmasters the digital dice which i uh, really really love and i'm probably never going to turn off um because they're so cool looking um Chris, congratulations to you and the whole team that brought this book to life with you. It is beautiful. I think people are going to love it. If they, if someone busts this out in 25 years at a con because it's their favorite classic adventure, what do you think will be the thing they're trying to uh, bring back or hold on to or remember that makes this their fave? Um, that is a fine question. And I don't think there's one answer to rule them all. Uh, I think it's everybody there's something there's there's a lot for there's a lot in here and people will glom onto different things and be enchanted by parts of it uh more than others i'm sure um but i think it has a great replay value um and that might be one of the winning characteristics is they know when they run it for the third time that it's not going to be the same uh, as it was the last two times I can't wait. I can't wait to jump into this game. I hope if you're watching this, you'll go ahead and work on grabbing some Wild Beyond the Witch Light for your table and for your friends. And uh, to Chris and Milo, thank you both so much for joining us. Yeah. And let me let me know on Twitter when you find the Milo cameo. I will. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, I'm excited. <laughs> um, and I know you're talking right. to the audience, but I forget they're here sometimes. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, where can the people find you if they want to know more about what you're doing? I am on Twitter occasionally at Chris Perkins DND. Other than that, I'm in my Fey domain making magic. <laughs> we have our answer. Arch Fey it is. Thank you so <laughs> much. We're all looking forward to the release on Tuesday, and we will see you next time on DD Beyond. It's DND. Yeah.